Hi, everybody. Great to have you with me. Great to be here. My name is Erez Berkner. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called uh, Lumigo. And uh, today I'm going to share with you uh, what uh, uh, Lumigo is doing uh, in its backend. So just as an overview, uh, Lumigo's backend, I'm not going to talk a lot about the, the product, but uh, Lumigo's backend is 100% serverless. And the essence of this talk is to share with you how we implemented our CICD uh, based on uh, serverless in our, for our serverless environment. Um, this is going to be, um, I will try to make it a very concrete presentation so you can actually get out of here with specific uh, tools, ideas, best practices that you can go ahead and implement. Uh, I'm gonna, I have a lot of things I want to share with you, a lot of tools, a lot of best practices, so I'm not going to go very deep into every topic, uh, but I did add uh, links in almost every slide, so you can uh, uh, take a picture, you can, uh, the presentation will be shared later, uh, so you can uh, have more information about everything I'm doing. I'm talking about and uh, I will be here after the session to uh, uh, extend on anything that, uh, that uh, you would like to talk about. Uh, a few words about me. Um, I'm a developer, uh, today mostly developer by heart, but uh, this is what I've been doing for the last uh, 20 years. I've been uh, managing uh, a cloud R&D uh, divisions, uh, mostly in a, a cybersecurity company called uh, Checkpoint, uh, until I uh, founded Lumigo with uh, my partner uh, two years ago. And in the last couple of years, we are focusing on microservices and serverless. So this is what I do all day long. So uh, that's uh, my background. Uh, Lumigo is a SaaS platform that, that helps you monitor and troubleshoot and trace your serverless applications. So at the end of the day, connect all your different pieces into a single story. best $20,000 I ever invested. <laughs> uh, great. Um, so I, I mentioned briefly what Lumico does. Very important, we are 100% serverless in our backend. So this is what we've been doing. We are serverless with our CICD and with our um, entire backend. We are, we are based on AWS. When I say serverless, by the way, I mean everything from API Gateway to Lambdas to SNS, SQS, DynamoDB, uh, Kinesis, and so on and so forth. Zero VMs, zero containers. Uh, we build a system uh, with DevOps mind from day one, so everything is as code, including the infrastructure. We've been doing that for the last two years, uh, and we have dozens of deployments per day to our uh, production. What's in it for me? I always like to start what you can expect in this session. Uh, you're gonna learn how we are doing DevOps in the serverless world. I do wanna say, uh, this is a very young uh, domain. So this is how we do stuff. Maybe you're doing it differently. Maybe some, like there, there are different things that can work. So I'm sharing my view. I am opinionated, but, but uh, take this with a grain of salt. We're gonna get very practical. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to achieve uh, self-service without the need to have dedicated DevOps or QA guys as part of the uh, CICD cycle. Uh, and at the end of the day, hopefully this will help ship quicker. So we're gonna talk about very briefly uh, what is serverless for those of you who don't know what serverless is. Uh, we're going to talk about the DevOps infinity loop that uh, uh, I assume most of you know, but we're going to revisit that with focus on serverless. We're going to talk about our best practices, and we're going to do a quick demo about how we are using uh, uh, our, our own platform to test, to monitor as part of our CICD pipeline. Before I start, I want a quick question. How many of you are using serverless, AWS Lambdas, and other services today in production environments? Okay, cool, so that's like 30% of the audience. How many are planning to use that in the next year? Okay, 
Great. Um, so very quickly about serverless. Um, I always like to show, to, 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 to explain serverless li like getting uh, to your destination. So you have different ways to do that. Uh, you can uh, get, do it uh, by uh, buying a car. You own the car, you need to fuel it, you need to navigate to where you want to go, and you need to actually drive and get there. Um, you can also rent a car, so you don't need to own the car and pay up front. Uh, you do need to fuel it to navigate and to drive there. Uh, you can take public transportation, so you don't own it, you don't fuel it, but again, you need to figure out how to get there and actually get there, or you can get an Uber. And then you only focus on getting there. And this trend of different uh, transportation options focus more and more on getting there and not about the, the details of how this is actually being done. And this is, uh, simulates the cloud evolution. So let's think about that in terms of physical servers, virtual machine containers, and serverless, uh, and the different layers of what you need to do to have them. And again, the focus as we move forward from physical to virtual to containers to uh, functional service and serverless, focus is on implementing your business logic and not about how you do it and focusing on what's unique to your organization. So uh, serverless allow you to do a lot of things in terms of uh, run a more and more workload with minimal amount of uh, operation and maintenance. You don't maintain the operating system. You don't patch it. You don't, uh, you don't really care about scalability. It's uh, within asterisks. Uh, but at the same time, it, it forces you, and uh, I think that's a good thing, to, to think in a different way. Think about microservices. Think about how you get different small pieces together and hook them together. This uh, get to the point where I like to call it nano services where you have many, many, many small pieces that need to talk with each other in new ways. Those ways are usually asynchronous with many queues in the system. So it really changes the way that we implement our architecture. Uh, most of service environments are self-managed, meaning I am not in control anymore. Somebody else is providing me services. Maybe that's the cloud provider or somebody else, but I can no longer deploy agent, for example, on my compute. If that's a function managed by somebody else, where do I put the agent? So that's a, a point to remember. And third thing, which is very, very important and interesting, is the cost paradigm. Uh, I no longer pay for something that I don't use. If I have a server, I rent it, I rent it for a month, I pay for that month, no matter how, how much users do I have. But in serverless, you don't pay for idle. So even if you have an architecture, an application based on serverless, if you have no visits to your site, you will pay zero. And that's an important uh, notion in serverless. This comes with a, this, 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 so I do want to say, this is a great technology. We love it, we use it all day long. Uh, I encourage you to use it, but at the same time, it brings new challenges to, uh, to, to, to the implementation, to the architecture. First of all, how do I identify issues in, in those environments? How do I get alerts? How do I make sure I know when something goes wrong and I am able to zoom in to understand what exactly is happening? And this becomes harder when, again, I'm not in control. I gave that control for, for the Uber guy because I don't have the car anymore. So how do you do that in service environments? That's a, a big challenge. Uh, how do I understand the costs of such environments? Again, it's per call, it's per demand. So how do I use it? How do I predict it? How do I forecast all of that become challenging in such a dynamic environment? How do I get visibility? I now have dozens or maybe hundreds of services in my production environment. This is nothing I can comprehend. Uh, how, do, can I, how can I zoom out and understand what's going on within my environment? So, this is about serverless, about the domain, and I want to focus now on uh, the CI/CD. And how many of you never seen this infinity loop? Okay, how many of you are embarrassed to say you never? Okay, no, I'm kidding. 
so hopefully most of you have seen this. This is a DevOps world. Uh, this is DevOps in Infinity Loop. We're going to go through that, how we implemented our CICD. And I'm going to show you what's interesting, what's different when it comes to serverless. A um, few guidelines, our guidelines. Uh, cloud, na cloud native, we do er everything in the cloud. That's probably not, not, not specific to serverless. Um, infrastructure as a code, again, not specific to serverless, but very, very critical to automate everything. When I'm going to talk about things that are specific to serverless, you're going to have this nice meteor on the side. Uh, managed services. Again, serverless is managed services. We don't have infrastructure. We don't have servers. So we try to implement the same concept in our CI/CD pipeline. We outsource uh, everything we can to any, any software as a service that uh, uh, we can have. Um, automated gates. Uh, we automated a lot of the gating process to get uh, deliver, deliveries done uh, and, and, um, and merges into the, the production and deployments. We're going to talk about that. And we don't have a dedicated QA or a ops at all. Uh, and that's partially by the fact that the system is, the CICD is self-served. So every developer can operate it and it's almost automatically, automatic, automatically done um, by the developers. So let's um, briefly review part of our stack. It's not all of our stack, but we're using Python. We're using a, a Node.js. Uh, we're using Jira, uh, GitHub, PyTest, and uh, Mocha for, for test, uh, testing frameworks. Serverless frameworks uh, for uh, serverless deployments. How many of you heard about serverless framework over here? OK. So it's, it's a great framework to deploy uh, serverless applications uh, based on, it's based behind the scenes on uh, cloud formation. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about that. Circle CI, uh, code cop for code coverage. And we use our own platform, Lumigo, to test our environment and to monitor that in production. So let's go uh, through the different uh, stages. Uh, very basic about uh, our, our um, planning process. We started with a, a Kanban where we had, the, like last year, uh, when we were more focused on a, a specific uh, MVP and POC stages. We moved to Scrum when we wanted to make much more parallelism in, in our development. We use Jira. It has great connectivity to GitHub, to CodeCov, uh, and to additional. It's, it's, it's industry standard. Uh, there is a concern about Jira that it's too heavy, it's too complex. We found out that if you spend some time in configuring it and getting rid of all the unnecessary fields, you can make it very lean and simple to operate. And this is what we, do, we did. So I highly recommend to spend time on your, not, don't just take Jira and implement, spend time to customize it to your own needs and it can get a very, very uh, uh, lean. Um, on the coding, we use uh, GitHub. Um, we use a branch per feature. So every feature is a, a new branch uh, we create. Um, as I mentioned, we use serverless framework um, um, as part of our uh, implementation. Um, Multi-repo versus monorepo. That's a very big question. I, again, I'm going to tell you my view. Uh, that's, uh, that's a whole debate about whether you should uh, use monorepo versus uh, multi-repo. We're using, using a multi-repo. Uh, actually, we have a repo per flow in our environment, which basically make our life much simpler when we want to change and work on a specific um, uh, flow. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but uh, we do have a great blog about that. So if you're interested about how to implement, it, implement your repo, especially in microservices and service environment, I highly recommend this, uh, this link. Uh, this is an example. I'm not sure if you can see it, but this is an example um, of, uh, um, uh, 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 of what we actually do when we want to uh, protect our branch. So this is part of the automation I mentioned. So for example, over here, um, we define that code review is must. We define that this must, you cannot deploy like a merge before you 
uh, go through a integration test and the system automatically sees the output of the integration test and can approve that. Um, of course, you, you must use the latest uh, brand for that. So all of these things are things that uh, we defined uh, as gating points for, uh, um, for the integration. Uh, test and, uh, and build. Um, so we test locally, and that's a very interesting point because when you go serverless, we are 100% in the cloud. But we still test locally things that are, we're able to test lo locally. So we, you, we do a, a linting and we do unit testing uh, on the code itself locally. But at the same time, we don't use service mocks. So, and the reason for that, we tried that, by the way. There are services that try to mock DynamoDB and try to mock SQS and others. Uh, it didn't work for us. The, the API changes too frequently and the internal implementation showed us that there is a significant differences between the actual implementation and the testing. Uh, so at the end of the day, we are testing uh, the integration in the cloud. I'm gonna talk about that in the integration testing in a second. Um, we have a git pre-commit hooks, that's uh, uh, nothing special for serverless. And again, we, we blog a lot about how we do things because that's a lot of evolution that happens inside the organization. Uh, this is from our uh, director of R&D, uh, testing uh, serverless from the trenches. Again, a uh, great uh, read if you wanna get deeper into testing. Uh, more about testing, uh, we talked about uh, linting, we use black and prettify, um, MyPy for a static uh, type analysis. Uh, we unit test using uh, Jest, Mocha, PyTest, and uh, we use Lumigo to test our, uh, to see the, the, the result of the testing and, and troubleshoot and debug. Uh, and we use a code call for a code coverage. Integration tests uh, is very interesting in serverless. Um, in serverless and in general in microservices and distributed system, integration test is super critical. Uh, and you must have some kind of framework to make sure you input something on one side the, and, and you observe the system to make sure the output is what you want and on the other side, like 50 services uh, that way is what you expect and also the system behaves as you expect it to behave. Uh, we couldn't find actually a good enough tool at the time to, to do that for us. Uh, there are some beginning of open source tools that try to do that, but uh, we developed our, our own uh, homebrewed uh, uh, um, solution for that testing framework. And uh, again, once again, we use our own system, our own platform to make sure we're able to examine different parts of the test to understand what happened in different parts of the execution. I'm gonna show that in, in a couple of minutes. We have personal dev environments. We have AWS account per developer. And that's, that's very important. So if you, you're not doing that today, do that. It doesn't cost you anything more, really. Uh, it's very easy to manage with, uh, in AWS uh, case, with AWS uh, uh, organizations, and it makes uh, the life much easier in terms of collision, in terms of setting up an environment and, and, um, and understanding what happened. Test on the cloud, uh, I mentioned that. Uh, and again, if you want to uh, drill down into how we implement the integration testing, um, here's the link. This is an example of uh, our Circle CI and uh, integration tests. Uh, so we have a couple of uh, tests here. Some pass, some fail, but uh, this is the end of the day. This is what, uh, we, how it looks like. Um, release. We have two main things uh, in release. Uh, we have a, a, the developer does a pull request followed by a code review. Uh, and once approved uh, and there's a merge, uh, we put a new version uh, tag on that, uh, uh, after that uh, merge. Uh, so we have that special tag per uh, flow. Um, that's an example of the release gating. Uh, so in this case, the merge is blocked because you haven't reviewed your code yet, but 
Uh, again, this is automatic. Uh, almost everything in the system is automatic, so the developer gets a very uh, easy understanding of what he needs to do to deliver, and, and that's uh, part of the way why we don't really need, need uh, uh, DevOps. Uh, on the deployment, I talked about um, um, serverless frameworks that help us do that, but uh, specifically, we have incremental deployments. So even if we have a, a new version with like 20 services in a specific flow that has that new version, but only a specific service, a specific Lambda changed, the deployment will be incremental, meaning only that specific Lambda will be deployed. So we deploy only the changes. Um, we have a, that's very important actually, we have a unified deployment script both for the integration tests and for the production. So it's 100% the same script with different environment variables, et cetera. Uh, but that's, that we didn't start by that, but that makes our life much easier uh, in terms of uh, not having different things happening in integration and uh, in production. Uh, we use the frameworks, we talked about serverless framework, and in some cases, uh, uh, cloud formation of AWS, but we also augment and wrap them with Bash scripts where we needed to add additional um, um, deployment instru instructions. And we implement Canary deployment, and there is a great tools for Canary deployments within AWS environments. Some uh, limitation, all of those are covered in, in, this, uh, in this blog. This is an example of a, a deployment, and uh, I think one of the interesting parts is that what we do is we actually implemented uh, parallel mechanisms to deploy services, and that's very important in microservices. If you have 15 services to deploy, we actually started by doing that linearly, one by one, and deployment time was more than an hour. And after we wanted to improve that, we started to like, build a mechanism of understanding the dependencies and then deploying um, in parallel. And now the deployment is less than five minutes. So parallel deployment has worked very good uh, for us. Operate. Uh, serverless uh, does mean two things technically. It's immutable. You cannot uh, log into the server. You cannot change configuration. Puppet and Chef are irrelevant for serverless environments. You don't really have a server. And that I think that's a good thing. Um, and it's short-lived. So you cannot uh, uh, have really have state between calls in your serverless environments. Uh, and your Lambda functions. Um, that's one thing to remember. Uh, it actually also make, make, by the way, your life more secured or your environment more secured because the attack surface is much smaller and, and much uh, um, uh, more limited in the time it's, uh, it's there. Auto scaling uh, is great. This is a, uh, so AWS offers you almost infinite auto scaling. Uh, it's not really infinite, uh, but uh, it's a great concept. You build for one invocation and you can uh, take it to like 1,000 invocation at the same second with the same architecture. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be concerned about what happens when the system go goes out of control. So a quick story um, about a bug we had in our system. We had a loop in accidentally in one of our implementation, and we had a lambda that actually triggered, um, uh, pushed something to SNS, and the SNS triggered that lambda again. But the problem is that it triggered that lambda twice. So we got a loop of one triggering two lambda, one triggering two lambdas. It, it was exponential, and we very quickly got to thousands of thousands of invocations of lambda running concurrently. We had an AWS bill of over eight, $800 just for 30 minutes. Um, and that's a lot for us over a month. Um, but the good thing is we had alerts on, those, on that stuff. So we, we very quickly uh, understood that and, and, and fixed it. So what I want to say here is auto scaling is great, but make sure you have, if you go serverless, make sure you have alerts on those things 
to make sure that if something goes wrong, if something is behaving out of the normal, you know, you, you get alert on that and you can handle that. Same goes, by the way, for DOS attacks. If you have a denial of service, in, in, in serverless world, we call it denial of wallet because it's no longer about the capacity of the server. It's about how much it's gonna cost you. The system is gonna serve uh, what's needed in terms of the attacker, but you're gonna pay for it. So that's another uh, very important point. So I talked about that and watch your limits, not only about cost, but also about uh, timeouts, about memory, about concurrency, about a lot of other things that you need to be aware of in terms of uh, serverless. And serverless is not no ops, okay? That was some of the promises people said that serverless is gonna make DevOps uh, uh, not needed anymore or operation not needed. It's not really true. You do need to operate. You, you do need to understand the CICD. You need to, you need to configure the environment. You need to monitor and operate it. It makes things much more sim sim simple. You don't need to patch things, and, but, but still, it's not no ops. Uh, monitor is the last part I want to share, and I want to talk to you uh, quickly about why we actually need to monitor. Um, of course, we want to first of all understand the system is uh, healthy. We want to know when something goes wrong. When something goes wrong, we want to understand what is the business impact, and that's critical, especially in serverless and microservices, because the fact that some function in my environment failed doesn't mean that I have a business problem now. I actually need to understand from this specific function I don't even know about, what was the end game? What was the business impact on API, on user? Uh, in which, who is the user? What is that flow? And that's becoming, if I had just like one or two servers, that's very easy. But if I have hundreds of components, that become a challenge to understand the business impact. Once we understand the business impact, we need to fix it. How do I drill down and I get to the root cause when the, the root cause might be like a, a hundred, a, a, a dozens of services away from the symptom. So we saw the problem over here, but we need to trace back everything to understand where the root cause started from. All of this goes into monitoring and tracing of uh, serverless. And the challenge here is that in serverless, again, we don't control the environment. We don't have servers. We don't deploy, a we can't deploy agents. So we need to do all of that with, uh, with kind of having a blindfold over our eyes. So the question is, how can we actually monitor and trace something that we don't control? And we uh, do that with Lumigo, and that's a great uh, segue to take a couple of minutes and show you how this is actually done, how is serverless monitoring and testing done uh, in Lumigo with Lumigo. So this is, a, as I mentioned, we are focusing on managed services. Lumigo is a SaaS service, so very easy to connect to the environment and uh, on board uh, with the username and password. And I want to take you through uh, two main uh, concepts. One is the concept of uh, alerts. Uh, I mentioned that you need to monitor and understand things in your serverless environments. Again, concurrency, memory, cost, a, a lot of alerts. If you're a serverless expert and you covered all that, that's great. If not, you need to make sure you get these alerts baked into the environment. Uh, one of the things that uh, we do at Lumigo is we get all of these alerts baked in out of the box and monitor your environment to make sure that we let you know to Slack, to PagerDuty, whatever you, you work with, that something needs handling in your environment. So if you get a Slack alert, or in this case, you, you get an alert uh, over here about something went wrong. And I mentioned some function down the, 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 the flow went uh, 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 failed. In this example, there's, there's an exception over here. So I know that something happens. And now, how do I get and understand the business impact of that? Uh, and using systems like Lumigo that allow you to connect the pieces and zoom out and understand how the story of a request started from the beginning to the end, you can actually understand the business impact. So by clicking, I can actually get an understanding of what's going on in my environment. This is the story of the transaction. This is what happens, this is what happened before the lambda failed. This is a specific lambda that failed. 
but very quickly we can go over here and understand that there's an API called new cells processing that initiated everything. So new cells processing is pretty important. It's an external API, it can understand who is using that and what was the impact. So very quickly, by getting this trace, I can understand what is the business impact. And now I, I want to understand the root cause. So in order to understand the root cause, what I would do in a non-serverless environment is go to my stack trace and look at the top um, line and start from there. What failed and then go backward. That's exactly what we allow you to do in your serverless environment. So going to the deepest level over here, which is the DynamoDB, I can click on this and I can see information about that specific request. Although there might be like thousands or hundreds of thousands logs in the system in that second, uh, you drill down over here to the specific request of the DynamoDB. You can see the inputs, like what you tried to write to DynamoDB, and what was AWS uh, reply. Specifically, there is a, a one or more parameters invalid due to empty strings. This is the exception. The DynamoDB replied, and specifically, we can actually see the empty string over here that we tried to write. This is a shipment confirmation idea. Let me make it bigger. This is, all of this information uh, is not information that is available in CloudWatch or in CloudTrail or anything else. So either use a tool like Lumigo to get that out. Lumigo actually get that information out for you or implement your own code to do that through logging uh, in every one of the services. But without that, you won't be able to actually understand what happened uh, and you will need to deploy new, de new you need to deploy to production in order to have that logs in place. But this is really just the beginning because I have no idea why this is an empty string. So in a monolith environment, I would now go to the service that called this DynamoDB. Uh, and in a serverless environment, I now want, want to go to upstream, to the Lambda that called that DynamoDB. And that's exactly what we allow you to do. So, this is the lambda that called. We correlate the invocation of the lambda to show you the lambda, this lambda failed due to an exception. Uh, and this, there were two retries over here. So this is a mechanism by AWS that retries whenever there's a failure. We correlate that and show you the different invocation and retries and all the information of every retry. And for each invocation, we share with you a lot of information that you will need in order to debug and understand the root cause. So for example, what was the stack trace of that specific lambda? Uh, what was the event and the input that the lambda got at that specific invocation? Uh, what were the environment variables of the lambda at the time? Maybe this is 30 uh, days ago, but, and you moved and there's a new version, but this is like a time machine to what exactly was the state at that uh, time, and all the logs, all the logs of that specific invocation. All of this information you need to have in order to actually debug serverless environments. And uh, again, if you're not using tool like Lumigo, at least you need to have some way to correlate events. So you can look at uh, open source tools like Open Tracing, uh, which is open telemetry today, uh, uh, Zipkin, and a few others that basically do the same. Uh, you need to integrate, you need to write code for them, but you need to have a solution to connect the dots uh, with a correlation ID or request ID through the different uh, system types. And so on and so forth. I, I don't want to uh, take you through the entire uh, process, but for every service, uh, including external services, in this case uh, Twilio, for example, you can see all the information. This is how we actually monitor our environment, but also this is how we actually test our environment in integration test. I mentioned we need to have a way to understand what's getting into the system and what's the output. This is how we do that uh, in uh, Lumigo. Last thing I want to show over here is um, how we actually monitor. So we talked about monitoring, about understanding uh, what's going on within my environment. Uh, this is how we look at functions, about uh, all the functions that exist in my account. I have 52 functions. A amount of invocation and errors in the last 24 hours, and this is where I can see what is my most popular function, for example, and understand uh, how much time it tax takes in average, um, how much it costs, when it was last modified, etc. Or I can look at what are the most failing uh, 
function. So for example, uh, over here we have a function that failed nine out of 17 times. Uh, so we can actually drill down and understand what happened in each and every invocation of that environment. Again, it's not focusing about Lumigo. I'm showing Lumigo, but at the very basic, make sure if you go serverless, you have some sort of vendor or implementation of your own to be able to understand there's a problem and from that problem drill down and understand the correlation of events that led to that problem and by that getting to the root cause. Uh, takeaways. Serverless is a paradigm shift. Uh, it's very different. It's great. It's, I can tell you I, today at Lumigo we have a pace of delivery that I never seen before in my 20 years managing uh, development. Uh, so highly recommended, but you need to get, you need to learn that. You need to, you need to get into the state of mind of how to implement uh, microservices and serverless in a managed services um, environment. Uh, adjust your DevOps loop to the new world. Uh, we talked about that. In a distributed serverless world, automation is important, but monitoring and visibility are key. Uh, we talked about how this environment is, is, is how you're giving away the control of the environment. Make sure that if you do that, you have the tools baked in, you have the open source implemented to make sure that you have visibility to what's going on in your environment, both in testing and in production. Otherwise, this will slow you down. Uh, and I mentioned a few blogs. Uh, out of many blogs in our environment, we write a lot about our experience, about what we learned in the last two years. Uh, so feel free to go to our blog and uh, get more information. Last thing I wanted to share with you is an announcement we made uh, in Serverless Days London uh, last month. Um, how many of you know this guy? Okay, in London he was a, a great um, famous guy. Uh, this is Jan uh, Kui, uh, aka the Burning Monk, one of the biggest thought leaders in the serverless community today, basically opening all the keynotes in uh, serverless uh, uh, days and serverless conf. Um, we announced last month that uh, Jan is joining Lumigo and he's heading our consulting services. So if you guys are going into serverless, need architectural review, workshop, training, anything of that sort, feel free to uh, send an email to consulting at lumigo.io. And um, it's really like uh, the, the, probably the best consulting you can have today for serverless environments um, um, architecture. So thank you very much. Uh, again, I uh, will stay over here. We have a couple of minutes for questions, but uh, if we can't get all the questions answered, if you want to talk to me personally, I will stay over here outside the uh, door uh, after the session, and I'll, I'll love to help to uh, anybody who has any question about uh, serverless. So any questions now? Yes, please. The question about integrations, uh, ser serverless integration frameworks that become in, uh, available. Best one I can talk about, we're not using that, so I try to only talk about what we use. Uh, there's a great uh, startup called seed.run. Uh, that's a startup that uh, is trying to solve that problem. Um, I would take a look at them, uh, but again, I cannot uh, testify uh, from experience. S E E D D dot run. Yes, please. Yeah. The question was, uh, how do we basically do the tracing and build the map automatically for you? Uh, so we're not using Cloudtrail for that. We actually have our own uh, open source library that integrates automatically to the lambdas. And by doing that behind the scene, this is like zero changes from your side. We're able to have again, behind the scene, a hidden correlation ID that goes through all the different services and allows us to correlate everything and digest it and show you everything in one granular view. What is the integration point there? The integration point? It's, it's, a, it's part of, it's a serverless uh, plugin. It's a serverless plugin, a lambda layer that automatically taps into your environment and 
Doing that, it's like 15 minutes for, to connect the environment and having this uh, view. Yes, please. We don't mock Twilio. We, we're testing that in production, like not in production, but in the cloud. Uh, so we, again, we have a dev account for every developer and all, this, all the deployment is automated because all of our infrastructure are the code. So when you wanna do integration tests, you just click a button and everything is deployed to the dev environment, uh, to the developer environment. And as part of that, uh, the, the calls for Twilio are real calls that are happening, okay? Any other question? Great, thank you very much.